say thank you to everybody that filled in for us while, while we were away. It was a good time. Uh, we got to see some, some different parts of, the, of, of this nation, and uh, it was good. Glad to be home. There ain't, no, there ain't no place like home, I promise you. Amen. No place like home. Uh, message title this morning, Showdown in the Garden. Showdown in the Garden. And uh, as we start moving toward Resurrection Sunday, hello, Resurrection Sunday is coming. However, Good Friday's coming also. Amen. Amen. And we can't have Resurrection Sunday without Good Friday. And there's a whole passel of events that took place leading up to Resurrection Sunday, and it brought confusion, and it brought fear, and it brought uh, all kinds of uh, betrayals. It brought all these different responses from the people leading up to that. And so in the next few weeks leading up to uh, Resurrection Sunday, I want to I look at some of those events that led up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Amen? And not only the crucifixion, but the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? We are, we are here today, we have a hope today because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without that, we got nothing, folks. Amen. Amen. Father, this morning as we take a few moments to look at your word, God, it's been wonderful to, to worship you and, and to be back together, Lord, uh, with the family and, and to hear the testimonies of what you've done and what you are doing and what you are going to be doing, Lord, uh, and not in necessarily in regard to this church, but your church, Lord. And God, you're adding to it daily. And, and Lord, in, in many ways, you're, you're bringing in the multiplication process uh, of growing your church. So Lord, this morning, uh, as I uh, share your word, I pray God for your anointing on my life. I pray God for, for the anointing on your people to receive. I pray God that your anointing would go out again this morning over, that, over the internet. Lord, there, there's actually people out there that are watching this service this morning. And I pray, God, that it wouldn't just be an hour spent staring at a computer screen or a TV, but God, they would sense your Holy Spirit going through and touching them and your word ministering to them this morning. And in this house, I pray today, God, lives will be transformed and changed forevermore because we've been in your presence and we've heard your word. And I thank you for now, God, let this preacher be your mouthpiece today, I pray. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. So I think uh, probably an appropriate place for us to begin uh, for, uh, in this journey would be with the plot to kill Jesus. Amen? Because that's got to happen. That's got to take place before the resurrection can happen. And in Luke chapter 22, in the first six verses, read like this. And if you would, why don't you just stand with me this morning uh, for the reading of your word. Thank you, Lord. Luke chapter 22. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. And so he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money, so he promised and sought opportunity to betray him in the absence of the multitude. Father, I pray you bless this word today as we look at it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So see, the religious leaders of the day launched a literally a satanically inspired uh, plot to kill Jesus. 
and in and in verse thirty uh, in verse three here, it actually says, "Then Satan entered Judas, and he began to, or he agreed rather, to betray Jesus for money." And church, we are members, whether you know it or not. We we are we are members of of a rebellion against the prince of this world. Amen? Amen. We are, we are uh, members of a rebellion against the prince of this world. It's led by none other than the owner of this world. And, and we are assured of, assured of the victory that has already been won and been secured. We just celebrate it every year. Amen? The battle's already been won. But we have to remember this. This is where it starts getting a little dicey. But we, we have to remember that we have come from the enemy camp. Hello. Yeah. We, we have come from the enemy camp. And listen, we are used to having weapons of destruction when we fight. Amen? I want you to remember that. I want you to think about that. We, we have come from the enemy's camp and we are used to having weapons of destruction when we fight. And oftentimes, church, as, as, his, as his body, we don't realize that we have been given a different set of weapons. Amen? Amen. We've been given a different set of weapons. Well, what weapons are those, Pastor? Well, let me just share with you what Paul said. And Paul said that our weapons are not of this world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, he says, Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. That's important. You have to understand that they are in God for the pulling down of strongholds. He, he, he's not lining us up with, with excavators and, and D8 cats and cranes and, and wrecking balls and all that. No, our weapons aren't in, in tearing down strongholds. It's not, it's not in those physical kinds of things. Uh, they, they, are, they are mighty in God for pulling down. In fact, they're not even like the weapons of this world. They have, in fact, divine power to de demol demolish strongholds. Think about, if you will, think about with me for a moment when Joshua and the children of Israel crossed into the promised land and began to, to, to take possession. How many of you know it was already theirs? Yes. The promised land was already theirs. It had already been promised to them. It had already been given. They just had to go in and what? Occupy the land. Right. They had to take back receive, begin to, to take ownership of what had already been won for them. And we all know the story of Jericho. Amen? Amen. Jericho was a strategic place. Jer Jericho was, was, was a, a fantastic, fortified city. And, and in Sunday school, uh, you know, they... They taught that, that uh, this, this little boy, he went to Sunday school, and when he came home, to, to mom and dad didn't go to church. And, and so little boy come on the church bus, and, and when he went home, he said, well, what would you, you learn today in Sunday school? Well, he said, we learned about the walls of Jericho. And, and the family's like, oh, that's great. Well, what happened? Well, he said, man, he said, they had this whole battalion of tanks that moved in the area. And they had these bombers that flew over and they bombed the walls and, and they had mortars that were setting off. And it was, it was a massive thing that, that took place. And the, the dad said, now, wait a minute, Johnny, wait a minute. I might not go to church now, but I know enough about the Bible to know that that's not the way that went. And Johnny said, yeah, Dad, but if I told you what really happened, you wouldn't believe that either. <laughs> Amen. You, you wouldn't believe what they did. Listen, they just, when you walk around an a, 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 a armed fortress, a, a, a secured 
perimeter like they had in Jericho. When, when your battle plan is to walk around that thing and on the seventh day walk around it seven times and shout, that we let, we're not signing up for that battle plan. But that's God's battle plan. Amen. How in the world are we going to build a church out there when we've only got 400,000? 300,000. So I'm speaking prophetically. <laughs> I'm speaking evangelistically. <laughs> Amen? Uh, I mean, we just speak that the, it's going to happen by... Faith, the same way the walls of Jericho came down, the same way everything happens that makes any difference in our world, which is done by faith, that's the way the walls came down. They were obedient to what God said. And church, we have to become obedient to what God said. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in every area? <laughs> I lost some of you right there. Do we or do we not believe that in every area? Amen. Okay, I'm just checking. See, we got a different set of weapons. They're not like the weapons of this world. They have divine power that will, in fact, demolish strongholds. And, and God's mighty weapons are this. They are faith. How's faith a weapon? They are truth. They are righteousness, the gospel message, and the word of God. Those are, those are all weapons of our warfare. How many of you know that, that faith can move mountains? Faith can heal the sick. Faith can provide for this building. Faith can, can tear down the walls of Jericho. Truth. Truth is strong. Amen? When you start telling the truth, You begin to move in power. Righteousness. The gospel. The gospel message never gets old. It never gets tired. The Holy Spirit equips every one of us as Christians for the struggle that provides. The Holy Spirit provides the, the weapons that we need. Jump ahead in, in Luke chapter 22 to verse 31 and 32 and look what it says. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. That your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me. Listen, I, I've read that. I don't know how many times I've read this passage of Scripture. But when I was preparing yesterday for this message for today. And I read that. And, and when you have. It just jumped out at me. That God already knew that Peter was going to blow it. And he already knew that Peter was on his way back. Peter was going to come back. It wasn't a forever thing. He said your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me me. Amen. Strengthen your brethren. I don't know about you. All I know about is me. And I know the battles and I know the struggles. I know the things that I fight every day in my life. And I'm beginning to learn. I'm beginning to understand that the, 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 the pitfalls that we find ourselves uh, bailing off and just bailing into, God has already seen that. And God has said, listen, are you going to lay there in the muck and the mire, or by faith are you going to rise up and return to me and strengthen the brethren? And see, it's a choice that we have to make. Let me tell you something. Dead people can't do that. I'm going to explain to you why. This is another little something that gets... Ding! You know the light. Oh. Aha. Uh -huh. Anybody besides me have those more? Ah. <laughs> hey. Wow. Sometimes he just, like a tuba six and just pow right in the face. Wake up. You see, people, people that are dead, they, they can't walk by faith. They can't walk by faith. You know why? Because they're dead. 
The Bible says, before we came to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we is dead. Are you with me? But when you get saved, you are born again. And when you're born again, you have enough life in you that you can reach your hand up and God will give you a hand up. Or one of your brethren will give you a hand up. But when you're dead, you're just dead. Are you with me? Jesus says to Peter, listen man, I've prayed for you. I have prayed for you. He prayed for faith. Oh man, listen to this. Jesus prayed for faith, not the removal of the test. We're all saying, God, take this thing away from me. God, take that thing away from me. God, take that thing away from me. God, you know, I don't want this and I don't want that. And all the time, sometimes, I shouldn't say all the time, but oftentimes, he's saying, listen, you just go through it. I'm going to take you through the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you're with me, your rod and your staff. Through the valley, not just into the valley. Jesus prayed for faith, not the removal of the test. Listen, that is vital. That is important for you and I to realize when, when you're going through the trials and the tests, it's not because God don't love you. It ain't because God forgot about you. It's not because God said, hey, dude, you're on your own. I think so often that the enemy has been released to sift you and I. Listen. It's a process. This whole being saved thing, the longer I'm saved, the more I understand that it is a process. It, what, what do we say? It's not about over there. It's about right here. It's about this journey. It's about everything that, that we go through to get to there. When I'm on an airplane, I like to sit by the window because I want to see what's down there. And what's down there looks completely different from up there. It's perspective. It's perspective. Down here, I can see that there's trees and there's, you know, all this kind of stuff. From up there, it just looks like a big green blur. It's perspective. You, you, he, Jesus doesn't often remove the test from us, but he gives us everything we need to get through the test. Amen. The truth is he knew that Peter was going to fail. Otherwise, there'd be no need for Peter to repent. Yet Jesus was confident that Peter would turn back and also understood that Having faced this trial, Peter was again going to be able to strengthen his fellow believers. In, in Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 43, it says, Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as, was, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him, and he came out to the place and said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then angel, an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. Listen, you're in good company. I'm in good company. Jesus prayed just like we pray. If there's any way you can remove this trial from me. If there's some way you can remove this cup from me. If there's some way I don't have to go through this thing. Peter had one up, or Jesus had one up on us. He said, listen, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. 
See, Jesus asked the disciples to come with him and to pray so that they would not fall into temptation because he knew that he was soon going to be leaving them. Jesus already knew the events that were going to take place and he was doing everything he could to prepare his followers, his disciples for what was coming. And sometimes, church, I think we just, we just hear messages and, and, and we just sometimes, I, and I'm not trying to get kudos or anything else, I'm just saying sometimes we just re- take and listen to the message because, well, that's what preacher was preaching this morning. I'm not just preaching to hear myself talk. I'm not just preaching so you guys have something to listen to on Sunday morning. Woo, don't shout me down when I'm preaching, God. My job is to equip you. And when you've been equipped, there's a job for every one of you to be doing. Are you doing it? The good news is, you ain't going to stand before me and give an account of what you've done here on this earth. You're going to stand before God. I'll just move on. Jesus said, listen, you guys pray so that you don't fall into temptation. He also knew that they were going to need extra strength to face the temptations that were just ahead. Temptations to run away or to deny their relationship with him. Holy cow, did they blow it or what? We'd have been right with them probably. We'd have probably been outrunning them. These guys were about to see Jesus die. They were about to witness this, this man that they had put, they, they had walked away from everything that they knew and held dear to them. They had walked away from it to follow this guy because they believed what he said. They were, they were about to watch him die. After he died, would they still think that he was the Messiah? The Messiah it doesn't sound like the Messiah is the kind of guy that should be dying. I mean, he was making promises about a kingdom to come. Battles to be won. Victories to be had. The disciples' strongest temptation would undoubtedly be to think that they had been deceived. If any of you are in this place this morning, and I've personally led you to the Lord at this altar, one thing you never heard me say was, Everything is going to be great from here on out. Your life is just going to be like a bed of roses. It's just going to be a walk. I have never said that to you. And I won't say that to you because that's not true. When you cross the river, amen, then that's going to happen. Then life is going to be great. No more sin. No more temptation. No more crying. No more dying. No more sickness. No Hello? That's going to be a good day. But we got some valleys and some battles and some things that we have to walk through. And we have to come to grips with the idea that sometimes God does not remove the problem from my life, but gives me the strength and the faith to walk through the process. And Jesus, how many of you have ever felt like you're just on your own? I'm just by myself walking through this deal. Listen, he said in his word, and I asked you a while ago, do we believe it all or do we not? Because he said in his word, I will never, never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you wherever you go. And so we have to realize, even though sometimes it might feel like we're, he's not with us, he's with us. He's walking with us. He's guiding us. Remember his word says, there's this still small voice. Listen closely for it. Have you been tempted like the disciples were probably tempted to think that you've been deceived? Man, there's going to be good days and bad days. In verses 3 through 6, it reveals that the man who would betray Jesus is one that he handpicked. Jesus, you got to wrap your head around this. Jesus handpicked Judas Iscariot. 
and put him in charge of the money. Do you think for a moment that Jesus didn't know what was coming in three years? Why would, have you ever, have you ever thought about it? Did it ever cross, did it run through there? Why would Jesus handpick somebody that he knew was going to betray him? How many of you have ever been betrayed? Just raise your hand. How'd you handle it? <laughs> Whoa. How'd you handle it? I think Judas was there because Jesus wanted to show how to handle it. His betrayer was handpicked. All the other disciples were confused by Jesus' words, but Judas knew exactly what he meant. Jesus said, one of you at this table is going to betray me. And they're all like, oh, is it, was it, is it you? Is it you? Maybe you? What? It, is it me? He asked that question. Is it me? Like he didn't know. And Jesus sups with him, breaks bread with him, even in spite of all of that. They were confused, but Judas knew exactly what he meant. The betrayer was there. He was among them. He was joining them in this meal. He was one of Jesus' chosen twelve. And the words of uh, uh, Jesus' words here allude to Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9. And the psalmist said, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That's a reference in the Psalms is a reference of what Judas was going to do in G with Jesus in the upper room just before the crucifixion. Judas was fulfilling prophecy. All these things have to take place in order for your salvation, your redemption, and my redemption to be redeemed, to be purchased. Jesus' death was part of a divine purpose, and Jesus recognized that. When he was in the garden and he was praying, and the Bible says that it was great drops of blood, sweat as, as drops of blood, it, 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 was, it was a stressful time. Jesus himself prayed, Lord, if there's any way this can be taken from me, let it be. Listen, Jesus wasn't upset about the cross. Jesus wasn't upset about the beating that he was going to take. Jesus wasn't crying and sweating about the, the packing his cross up the Via Della Rosa. He wasn't upset about any of that. He was upset about the fact that his father, in a matter of days, his father was going to do something he had never done before, and that was take his eyes off of the sun because your sin and my sin was in that moment was going to be placed on Jesus, and the skies went black, the thunder crashed, and God took his eyes for the very first time off of his son. That's what was messing with Jesus. He knew all the other stuff had to be done to purchase your salvation and mine, to redeem us. Jesus' death was part of a divine purpose, but it does not remove, listen to me, this is because sometimes we don't like this part of it. It even though Jesus knew that 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 uh, Judas was going to betray him, and and it was prophesied and spoken of back in the Old Testament in, in places. It, listen. Jesus recognizes all that, but it does not remove the responsibility from the betrayer. I personally have a responsibility to stand against every trial and every temptation that comes my way. Did this die? That was a good place for an amen. Just, I'm just saying. You. 
personally are going to have to take responsibility for the pitfalls and the trials and the temptations that are presented to you. Amen. Amen. Judas allowed his desires to place him in a position where the enemy could manipulate him into doing the most dastardly deed in, in human history. He made in betraying Jesus the greatest mistake in, in, in all of history. But the fact was that Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, and it, but it does not mean that Judas was a puppet of God's will. We have to understand that. You have a free will. And when you fail to act on your will, when you fail to, to allow faith and the strength of the Holy Spirit to carry you through those times of trial and tribulation, and you give in to those, temp those tests and those temptations, you and me have to bear the responsibility for that failure. There's forgiveness there, absolutely, without question. There's grace. His mercies are new every morning. But I've got to rise up and say, God, forgive me. God, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. Because the one that's in me right now, apparently, ain't that good. Hello. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh God, but restore unto me the joy the joy of thy salvation. Oh God, I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I still got enough energy that I can reach up and get the hand of God and you pull me up out of this miry clay. Dead person can't do that. Dead person just laying there in the mud. Judas made the choice. God knew what the choice would be, and he confirmed it. And we have to remember that while it was, in fact, Judas that betrayed him, all the disciples fled, and Peter even denied even knowing Jesus. I don't even know who that dude is. Really? Remember what Jesus said? Listen to me, Peter. <laughs> Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. There ain't no way in the world... I'm, I'll go to prison. I'll fight for you. I'll do whatever cock a doodle do. Amen? God knew it. Here's the thing. We have to remember that while Judas betrayed him and the disciples fled and Peter denied knowing him, all the disciples came to Jesus for forgiveness. Judas never took the opportunity. The reality is he went out and he killed himself. Death, self-invoked self death, suicide, however you want to look at it, is a long-term solution to a short-term problem. Judas could have been forgiven. Even for selling the Savior for 30 pieces of silver down the river. He could have been forgiven, but he never, by faith, stepped up. I want to jump back to verse 47 through 51. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and they drew near to, and he, and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Remember what I said when I started? Our weapons have changed. Amen. The, our weaponry has changed. 
Peter was still fighting from the enemy's camp, if you will. Jesus let Peter know immediately that his type of warfare was out of place. Listen, Peter, you're no longer the guy that you used to be. Things are changing. Every one of you in this room, whether you're watching by way of the internet or whether you're here in this house this morning, you are not the same person that you were before you came to Christ. You have been born again. Some of you have not fully moved into that whole idea. Some of us are still just kind of skirting around the outside. We made the profession. We maybe even went so far as to get baptized, but we haven't sold out. Is this working? really got quiet right there. I hope that's because we're taking a look in here. Because when we sell out completely, everything about us will be changed. Our, our, our agenda will change. Our motivation will change. Peter, Jesus said, listen, this type of warfare is out of place. Peter cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant and Jesus said no more of this and reaches up and heals the man's ear. Puts it back on. Jesus, don't think for a second Jesus doesn't know why they're there. He knows. If it's me, I'm like, let, it, let the sucker bleed. Just let him bleed. Right? But that's flesh. And while Jesus was flesh, he was way more in the spirit than in the flesh. And he knew the, the Father's will. And he was walking toward that destiny in his life. And he said, look, Peter, I don't know how you do it. He reaches down, gets the, out of the dirt. I don't know if he brushed it off. My dad, my dad would have put iodine and mercurochrome and methylate on that sucker painted the whole side of his head red <laughs> set you on fire and you're burning up and then he'd go <laughs> which really helps <laughs> some of y'all don't know what that is I'm talking about these young kids over here they're like I don't know what that is because they we run you to the doctor my dad wasn't into running nobody to no doctor I'll fix that up for you no problem <laughs> <laughs> Woo! That's some good stuff, that methylate. <laughs> My dad used to mix that stuff with turpentine. Now, I'm going to date myself a little bit. How many of you remember what an atomizer is? A little glass bottle with a little squeezy modanger on the back of it, and you put it in there. He would, if you had tonsillitis, he paint the whole back of your throat with that stuff. Open up. Ah. Psst, 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 psst. You just tip over. <laughs> just somebody kill me, man. <laughs> I'm still here. Nothing wrong with me, but. <laughs> Anybody been painted with that stuff besides the preacher look at this yep everybody in the house uh, yeah I know what you're talking about right there hey it will change your life <laughs> you'll see visions and everything Jesus just reached down picked it up put it back on just like it never happened and I gotta have a I gotta think in my I gotta think in my in my spirit that that guy, all of a sudden, was having different thoughts about Jesus. In a moment. When the Lord touches you, you can hate Him all you want, but when He touches you, when He restores your ear to the side of your head, all of a sudden it's like, I don't know, I'm not sure I'm buying all what you guys are saying. 
See, the key, the, the key is that the weapons of our warfare are, are, are not destructive, church. They are, in fact, constructive. The weapons of our warfare are not destructive. They are constructive. Listen, we are to be building one another up, not tearing one another down. Listen, you get a lot more bears with honey than you will vinegar. It includes things like humility and forgiveness and resisting evil with good and holy attitudes and the Holy Spirit that is within us. Even those things that the world even finds offensive, which things like the cross of Christ. The world don't like the cross. They don't want to talk about the cross. There are those in the church that don't like talking about the blood. I remember preaching about the blood of Jesus, and I still do, and I always will. I had a sweet little old lady, and she said, Pastor, I just love your preaching. It's just wonderful, but could you just not talk about the blood so much? I just don't, I just don't like it when you talk about the blood. I said, Sister, if we can't talk about the blood, we ain't got nothing to talk about. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. How about the cross of Christ? How about the Word of God? Listen, the Word of God is not ours to pick and choose from. The Word of God is ours to follow. It is our instruction book. It is our guide. It is what we need to get through this world. When things are happening, when all hell's breaking loose against us and around us, God, it's then we need to get in God's Word and say, God, what are you saying to me? What are you trying to tell me in this thing? It's not just a great storybook. Although it is a great storybook. It's an instruction book. It is God's love letter to you and I. So the world finds the cross of Christ offensive. They find the word of God offensive. How about the prayers of the saints? Nothing blesses me more than to be up here on this platform on Sunday morning before church and, and people, little Kathy comes walking in here and and goes into that nursery room. Our, our little baby kids ought to be good that's, because that, that, that's the, they're using that for a prayer room. And them little, them little babies that go in there, they are walking into an anointed place. They are walking into a place that is saturated in prayer. And, and Tim comes in, he sits over there and he prays and different ones are just praying. Listen, it is the prayers of the saints of God that will carry. I've had men coming and talk to me today and said, Pastor, we've been praying for you. We've been lifting you up in prayer. Listen, I know you have. And I'm grateful for the prayers of the saints. Jesus won this showdown in the Garden of Gethsemane. And here's the thing, nobody really knew it but Jesus. Jesus won. Jesus won the, 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 the showdown in the garden, but the, the, the disciples, they didn't know it. His victory really doesn't look like a victory. Does yours? Oftentimes it doesn't. When we turn the other cheek, when we go the extra mile, when we forgive somebody a thousand times over, when we humble ourselves in the sight of men and God, when we pray on our knees, we quote from the Word of God, it does not look oftentimes as if we win, but church, we will win. We do win. We are on the winning side. We have won the battle. God loves you. Listen, let me tell you something. The enemy trembles. He would much prefer you and I go back to his style of battle. Evil for evil, sword for sword, and spite for spite. But that is not the plan of God. The plan of God is to do good to those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. Are you kidding me? I want to grab my enemy and punch him right in the face. That's what I want to do. How many of you recognize right off the bat that that is destructive and not constructive? It might be reconstructive, but... <laughs> See, you know what that is? That's man justifying his actions. Thank you, Lord, for that little tidbit.
It's true. It's true. See, the enemy knows how to fight on his terms. He ain't got any idea what to do when his greatest offenses become the showcase for God's greatest mercies. Amen. That's you and I. Man, we were, we, he owned us, lock, stock, and barrel. And one day we come to ourselves. And now he don't know what to do. Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Well, how do we fight the good fight? Paul uses active and forceful verbs to describe the Christian life. We are to run. We are to pursue. We are to fight. We are to hold tightly. Some people think that Christianity is a passive religion and advocates just sitting back and waiting for God to act. And that, my friends, ain't true. We are to go out. The Bible says in so many places that we are to be active. We are to be doing. We are Christians that should be active. The fields are white, but the workers are few. It's time. It's time for us to begin to move. The reality is we must have an active faith. We must be in training. We must be working hard. There must be something of sacrifice and doing what we know is right. Sometimes doing what I know is right don't feel that good. The good news is it ain't about how I feel. It's about what I do. So here it is. It's time for action on your part. Christian service, like athletes, requires training and it requires sacrifice. Our discipline and our obedience largely divine whether or not we will be contributors or merely spectators. Church, my job is not to put on a performance up here that you can sit out there and clap about. My job is to put a pair of spurs on, climb on you, and put spurs in your rib cage. That's the literal definition of to provoke. Another, another translation says to incite to riot. You guys don't look like you're rioting. You don't have to be. We are to provoke one another unto good works. My job is to provoke you. My job is to equip you. Our discipline and our obedience largely defines whether or not we will be contributors or spectators. I do not want to be a spectator. No way. I want to be a participator. In the enemy realm, I want to be an agitator. Amen. Right Amen. I want to be. I want to agitate the enemy. Every time somebody gets up and walks to this altar, and we lead them to this to the Lord Jesus Christ, I promise you that agitate. Amen. He is upset. Listen. Are your battles a reflection of the Spirit of God within you or are they consistent with the Spirit of this world? These are hard questions and you're the only one that can answer them. Are your battles a reflection of the Spirit of God? Oftentimes, and I'll just be honest today, folks, when I get into a battle, sometimes I feel like I just lay down and give up. Amen. It's time from the pulpit to the pew, that we recognize the enemy and rise up and say, not today, devil. Amen. Not today. Not today. 
Are your battles a reflection of the Spirit of God within you, or are they con con consistent with the Spirit of this world? One will lead you to victory. The other will lead you to darkness. Jesus demonstrated in the garden how we should fight. He took his disciples. He took those closest to him. He said, come, let's go to the garden. I, I, I want you to stay right here and I want you to pray. I'm going to go over here a little ways and I'm going to pray. Every time he came back, the church was asleep. The church was asleep. <laughs> I was told a story here this morning of a mother that wanted her daughter to be in church and daughter didn't get up. And so the whole time in church, she's texting, wake up, daughter, wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Got to come to church. Daughter's still not here because we're asleep. I don't, know, I don't know what took place yesterday that makes her so tired. I'm just using this as a, as a simple example. I'm not passing any kind of judgment whatsoever. But I am saying that the church is asleep. Amen. Why does it take something drastic to wake the church up to a place where we begin to move? When COVID hit, we submitted to that for a little bit. And it wasn't very long. And we said, come back and started having church and determined from that moment forward, we're not going back to that. Again, we are, we're not, I'm not afraid. I'm by faith. Church, what does it take for us to rise up every, tomorrow's Monday. Most pastors quit. I shouldn't say most, but a lot of pastors think about quitting the ministry on Monday. crazy I'm not I've thought about quitting I've thought about quitting a lot of times but what would that say to God if I bailed on what he called me to do you screwed this one up Lord I, I, I don't I'm not qualified for that in all my mess you're stuck with me until they pack me out of this place feet first Jesus demonstrated how to fight, and it was through prayer. So bow your heads with me this morning in this place. I don't know whether you're watching this morning by way of the Internet or, if, or, or what, but uh, I know this much. I know that a man named Jesus died on an old rugged cross to redeem you and to make you a part of His family. Just like Kyle came into this place, he took a risk and he said, Pastor, the reward was well, well, well worth the risk. So this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, people praying, let me just ask you today, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Is your name written down in the Lamb's book of life? This morning, would you like to be able to put your hand up and reach to Jesus, but because you're dead in your trespasses, as the Bible declares, you can't because you're dead. Here's the great news. When the Holy Spirit begins to minister even to the dead, you have an opportunity to react. You're not too far gone. You've not messed up too bad, too many times, too often. His mercies are new every morning. And today is your day. Today is your day.